As a youth, I visited the 1964 World's Fair in New York City. One of my favorite stops was the LDS Church Pavilion with its impressive replica of the Salt Lake Temple Spires. There, for the first time, I saw the film Man's Search for Happiness. The movie's depiction of the plan of salvation, narrated by Elder Richard L. Evans, had a significant impact on many visitors, including me. Among other things, Elder Evans said, Life offers you two precious gifts. One is time. The other, freedom of choice, the freedom to buy with your time what you will. You're free to exchange your allotment of time for thrills. You may trade it for base desires. You may invest it in greed. Yours is the freedom to choose. But these are no bargains, for in them you find no lasting satisfaction. Every day, he continued, every hour, every minute of your span of mortal years must sometime be accounted for. And it is in this life that you walk by faith and prove yourself able to choose good over evil, right over wrong, enduring happiness over mere amusement. And your eternal reward will be according to your choosing. A prophet of God has said, Men are that they might have joy, a joy that includes a fullness of life, a life dedicated to service, to love and harmony in the home and the fruits of honest toil, an acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of its requirements and commandments. Only in these, Elder Evans said, will you find true happiness, the happiness which doesn't fade with the lights and the music and the crowds. These statements express the reality that our life on earth is a stewardship of time and choices granted by our Creator. The word stewardship calls to mind the Lord's law of consecration, which has an economic role, but more than that, is an application of celestial law to life here and now. To consecrate is to set apart or dedicate something as sacred, devoted to holy purposes. True success in this life comes in consecrating our lives, that is, our time and choices, to God's purposes. In so doing, we permit Him to raise us to our highest destiny. I would like to consider with you five of the elements of a consecrated life. Purity, work, respect for one's physical body, service, and integrity. As the Savior demonstrated, the consecrated life is a pure life. While Jesus is the only one to have led a sinless life, those who come unto Him and take His yoke upon them have claim on His grace, which will make them as He is, guiltless and spotless. With deep love, the Lord encourages us in these words, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto Me, and be baptized in My name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Consecration, therefore, means repentance. Stubbornness, rebellion, and rationalization must be abandoned, and in their place, submission, a desire for correction, and acceptance of all that the Lord may require. This is what King Benjamin called putting off the natural man, yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and becoming a saint through the Atonement of Christ the Lord. Such a one is promised the enduring presence of the Holy Spirit, a promise remembered and renewed each time a repentant soul partakes of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Elder B. H. Roberts once expressed the process in these words, The man whose soul walks in the light and wisdom and power of God will at the last by the very force of association, make the light and wisdom and power of God His own, weaving those bright rays into a chain divine, linking Himself forever to God and God to Him. This is the sum of Messiah's mystic words, Thou Father in Me, and I in Thee.
Beyond this, human greatness cannot achieve. A consecrated life is a life of labor. Beginning early in his life, Jesus was about his Father's business. God himself is glorified by his work of bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of his children. We naturally desire to participate with him in his work, and in so doing, we ought to recognize that all honest work is the work of God. In the words of Thomas Carlyle, all true work is sacred. In all true work, were it but true hand labor, there is something of divineness. Labor, wide as the earth, has its summit in heaven. God has designed this mortal existence to require nearly constant exertion. I recall the prophet Joseph Smith's simple statement, by continuous labor we were enabled to get a comfortable maintenance. By work we sustain and enrich life. It enables us to survive the disappointments and tragedies of the mortal experience. Hard-earned achievement brings a sense of self-worth. Work builds and refines character, creates beauty, and is the instrument of our service to one another and to God. A consecrated life is filled with work, sometimes repetitive, sometimes menial, sometimes unappreciated, but always work that improves, orders, sustains, lifts, ministers, aspires. Having spoken in praise of labor, I must also add a kind word for leisure. Just as honest toil gives rest its sweetness, wholesome recreation is the friend and steadying companion of work. Music, literature, art, dance, drama, athletics, all can provide entertainment to enrich one's life and further consecrate it. At the same time, it hardly needs to be said that much of what passes for entertainment today is coarse, degrading, violent, mind-numbing, and time-wasting. And I'm just getting started. <laughs> Ironically, it sometimes takes hard work to find wholesome leisure. When entertainment turns from virtue to vice, it becomes a destroyer of the consecrated life. Wherefore, take heed that ye do not judge that which is evil to be of God. A consecrated life respects the incomparable gift of one's physical body, a divine creation in the very image of God. A central purpose of the mortal experience is that each spirit should receive such a body and learn to exercise moral agency in a tabernacle of flesh. A physical body is also essential for exaltation, which comes only in the perfect combination of the physical and the spiritual, as we see in our beloved resurrected Lord. In this fallen world, some lives will be painfully brief, some bodies will be malformed, broken, or barely adequate to maintain life. Yet life will be long enough for each spirit, and each body will qualify for resurrection. Those who believe that our bodies are nothing more than the result of evolutionary chance will feel no accountability to God or anyone else for what they do with or to their body. We who have a witness of the broader reality of pre-mortal, mortal, and post-mortal eternity, however, <clears throat> 